Hey guys, Dr. Gooden, professor of kinesiology and sports scientist, back again with another structural kinesiology video. This time we're diving into the wrist and the hand joints, specifically the bony landmarks. Okay, let's get right into the material. Okay, so here we are in the wrist and hand joint slides, and this comes from chapter seven of the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd, and the slides have been heavily edited by myself, Dr. Gooden. Now many sports, as well as activities of daily living, activities of daily living, require the precise functioning of the wrist and hand. Uh, I've got a bunch of sports listed here, but you know, I think pretty much almost any sport we think of uh, that requires you to manipulate some external object will use the wrist and hands, but also activities of daily living. We're thinking of typing, <clears throat> of writing, of eating, of driving. These all require um, your hand and your wrist to work well. So <clears throat> the wrist can do flexion, extension, abduction. So if we're in anatomical position, abduction will be away and adduction will be towards the body. We have 29 bones in the wrist and the hand, more than 25 joints. We're not going to talk about each one individually, but we might. We will summarize the joint actions of those that are similar to each other. And more than 30 muscles, 18 of which are intrinsic, and we won't talk about those in this lecture. We'll talk about the extrinsic muscles. So including the radius and the ulna, there are 29 bones, 8 rows of carpal bones. Carpal means wrist. <clears throat> in two rows of four, five rows of metacarpal bones. So those are the, the next bones uh, that are just distal to those carpal bones in the palm of your hand. 14 phalanges or digits. And these are your fingers. Three each for each finger except for the thumb, which only has two. And we call these prox uh, proximal, middle, and distal. The thumb has a sesamoid bone in its flexor tendon, thumb flexion. And there can be other sesamoid bones occurring in joints of fingers, just sort of randomly. <clears throat> so here's a picture of it. We have our eight, <clears throat> our eight rows of carpal bones from the proximal row um, on the radial side. So remember, radial side is going to be pinky side in anatomical position. And if we look at these two hands, we should probably label these so this is going to be the anterior aspect and this will be the posterior aspect. And the way you can tell is because here is the radius. And we know that the radius is on the thumb side and that it's more, um, it's larger um, at that uh, distal end. And then here's the radius over here again too. So in anatomical position, the thumb will be uh, pointing laterally, and so the radius will be lateral, and therefore this uh, picture on the right is the anterior view. We're looking at through the palm of the hand into the bones. The left picture is looking through the back of the hand, through the dorsal surface. So starting on the radial side and moving to the ulnar side, we have the scaphoid, and then the lunate is next, which is, is the lunate then triquetrium, and then the pisiform. Okay, and the next row, the next row will be the trapezium, and then the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. Okay, so the first ones, um, I'm, going to go, I'm going to go back to that first page. <clears throat> okay, so the first bones, the scaphoid, here we are. I'm just going to shade them in. That might help a little bit. And then the lunate is here, triquetrium, and the pisiform is showing up on this picture right here. And then for that second row, we have trapezium trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. 
All right, now an easy way to remember these is with a mnemonic. And the one that most college kids seem to remember is this one that I have on the screen. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. All right, uh, cue the laugh track. And the trick though with that is remembering where they start and where they end, right? So if you start this uh, mnemonic, it starts from the radial side and goes to the ulnar side, proximal to distal. Now the scaphoid is the most often injured of these bones. Um, it happens from falling on an outstretched hand and then that radius jams up into the scaphoid. You can think it's a sprain, a wrist sprain or something, but really you've crunched that scaphoid bone and it requires immobilization, maybe even surgery. Another thing that can go wrong in your wrist is what's called carpal tunnel. This is, um, we see this in, in very high frequency in repetitive flexing, wrist flexion motions, wrist and finger flexion motions. And the reason is because we see right here in this middle, this literal tunnel that's made by the carpals. You can see that the carpals form this arch. And in that arch is the tunnel through which we have a whole bunch of tendons running to our finger and wrist flexors. And if we if we are chronically engaging in wrist flexion, finger flexion, these tendons can become inflamed and put stress on this median nerve. Um, they can start to push on that median nerve and actually cause uh, burning, tingling, pain sensations down your hand. I knew a girl in high school who was a really good basketball player. She was getting recruited uh, by colleges. And she also at the same time, you know, trying to be responsible, she picked up a part-time job at Baskin Robbins scooping ice cream, right? And so we all thought, that's awesome. We can get free ice cream from her. Unfortunately, after two weeks on the job, she developed carpal tunnel syndrome, stopped hitting her free throws, stopped hitting <laughs> three pointers because of the pain that she was feeling and had to quit so that she didn't forego her scholarship. So two really important landmarks for the wrist flexors and extensors are the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle. And again, you can palpate these on yourself really easily. We did this in the elbow and forearm section. From the medial epicondyle and the, and the medial condyloid ridge and coronoid process, we have the origin for many wrist and finger flexors. We might call that the medial flexor wad. So we've got a bunch of flexors starting medially and running down and anterior um, <clears throat> on the anterior aspect of your wrist. And then that lateral epicondyle and supracondylar ridge, we have the origin for many wrist and finger extensors. So now on this lateral side, wrapping around, you have all of those extensor muscles. Okay, and that really wraps it up for this video. Uh, the key bony landmarks to focus on again are going to be that medial and lateral epicondyle of the humerus, as well as knowing the wrist bones and the bones of the hand. And in following videos, we'll talk about joint motions and movements, and then follow that up with muscle actions that cross those joints of the wrist and the hand. Thanks for staying with me through that overview of the bony landmarks of the wrist and hand joints. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below and I would love to try to answer them or point you to other resources that could help you continue to study. Um, if you want to continue learning about this topic, the next thing to cover would be the joint movements of this region and you can head on over here to this video to keep learning about that. If you missed any videos in the series, check out this structural kinesiology playlist. And as always, I'm Dr. Gooden here to try to make kinesiology concepts understandable and digestible for you. Thanks for watching.